Hi, I'm Jonathan Wernick, Global Equity Analyst at SAS Finwell, and today I'm joined by Craig Pfeiffer, Chief Investment Strategist at SAS Finwell. Hi Craig, thanks for joining us today. Oh, thanks very much, Jonathan. Uh, always good to talk about the model and particularly when it's done uh, fairly well. Yes, and that's why we are here today. We're going to be talking about the performance of SASFIN's global equity model. And it has been a positive quarter um, for a change. The, the previous quarters have been quite challenging to say the least, but the, the final quarter of 2022 was actually a, a positive one. Global equity is returning at 10% on average. And Craig, maybe you can just give us some of the reasons or events that led to that uh, positive performance. Yes, thanks, Jonathan. I think a lot of the... Um the weakness in the markets for the for the first part of the year was all about um, inflation picking up to uh, you know, unprecedented heights and central banks raising rates quite aggressively um, and uh, you know bond yields rose dramatically and all of that had a negative impact on uh, on equities um, and yeah and the bond market wasn't a place to be the equity market wasn't a place to be uh, and the market was trying to anticipate when would this when would the start turning around? When would interest rates peak and when would they start coming lower? Now, we certainly didn't get to that point, but in the fourth quarter, we started getting an inkling that maybe we were closer to the end than the beginning. Um, and um, it, it became a big phrase, the Fed pivot. When are they going to turn? Um, and, uh, and they started increasing rates at a slower pace. We got a, uh, a 75 basis point hike and then a 50 basis point hike um, at that meeting, with the expectation then that you know maybe the next move would be even even smaller. So that was a positive, starting to get to the end of this tightening uh, monetary policy uh, cycle, and uh, a big big positive in the quarter then was uh, was the Chinese move to um, lighten up a bit on their zero uh, COVID policy. Uh, we saw the Chinese people themselves protesting about. Um, about the situation being locked up and such strict lockdowns uh, impacting production, impacting livelihoods, just impacting uh, uh, the way people saw the world. Um, and uh, obviously there's, uh, there's production companies in our portfolios that produce things in China. Um, but the big, big takeaway from that opening up the economy again was that uh, we could really look to, to Chinese growth picking up um, in time Again, that demand coming through uh, people, the world demanding goods and services from China, China demanding goods and services from the rest of the world, um, and that driving earnings going forward. So I think that interest rates story, uh, along with the Chinese reopening, um, uh, were, were the two big components, I think, uh, why the fourth quarter was as good as it was, and the fact that we just got very tired <laughs> from, from uh, all these daily down days uh, that we needed a bit of a bit of a lift i guess at the end of it all sure yeah i think everyone is glad 2022 is behind us and i think what you just described is a, a good summary of what happened in global equity markets but maybe let's bring it a bit closer to home for us and our global equity model and how that performed and for the fourth quarter the global equity model returned about 11 percent so slightly better than global equity markets and if you drill down into more of the minutiae or the finer details, you'll see it was um, specific stock selection in certain uh, segments or sectors that really drove that outperformance. And maybe we can start on the, the positive side of, you know, some of those uh, sectors or companies within sectors that performed well, one being the industrial sector, we saw uh, really positive performances from the likes of Honeywell. Um, Siemens was also a really good performer during the quarter. Um, you know, another sector which uh, did really well for us um, was the information technology sector. Um, a lot of our holdings there performed well, specifically in the semiconductor space. Now, that uh, sector has been under a lot of pressure during the year, but we saw uh, a decent pullback during the final quarter. Uh, some of our holdings, ASML, NVIDIA, uh, uh, giving us quite good returns during the quarter. Um, we can go into a bit of detail on those companies but i just want to go back to you again because you mentioned um the chinese story which i think was uh, quite a big uh, event that happened and that definitely benefited perhaps indirectly some of our holdings so maybe you can just touch on um companies like lvmh uh 
Nike and AIA, the, the impact of that reopening? Yes, I think, you know, with lockdown, uh, with, with cities, big cities in the, in the country lockdown, uh, it means people can't get out to shop. Sure, they could shop online, but, uh, you know, a lot of people like the experience of, of trampling the malls. Um, but that definitely had a positive impact on the like of, uh, of Nike. Um, their, their issues generally have been about an inventory build-up um, uh, over time, and, and the market took a jaundiced view of that. Um, but they did seem to uh, come through with some positive numbers, getting through some of that inventory, um, their direct-to-consumer plan uh, working um, quite nicely. Um, and I think that the results helped them, but it was the environment that, that helped generate those results. Again, more travel opening up, the prospect of um, more travel in and out of China, uh, Chinese travelers also, you know, getting more around the globe, um, you know, less restrictions at the airport, at the front gate there, uh, getting people flying again uh, for companies like LVMH. Um, the very reliant on tourism and, and people moving about and buying that special gift, um, very snazzy and expensive gift um, uh, at airports or, or, or when they're on, uh, you know, when they're in those big cities. So LVMH was a positive um, given the Chinese um, influence there. Uh, and then AIA, I mean, it's a big Asia-Pacific um, insurance company. Uh, and just with lockdown, it lets their distribution force get out there and sell more of their, their policies and, and the goods they have to offer. So I think the market also saw that uh, as a positive. But uh, you know, China is such a big part of the global economy. Uh, its fingers are in all the pies everywhere. From, uh, from the point of view of them demanding or, or exporting stuff, but importing um, as well. And I think that importing side and the prospect of greater growth, uh, as you mentioned, that helped a lot of those industrial metals um, too. So a good, uh, a good quarter on the back, a lot of that on the back of that Chinese lightening up, opening up again. And I think um, just to remind uh, people uh, we really like LVMH and Nike because they have really powerful brands that, that resonate with their customers. Mm -hmm. And that those brands uh, provide them with tremendous pricing power, which is going to be really important um, if we go into more difficult times, the ability to continue to just pass on those price increases. I think that's one of the main reasons why we hold those companies and will continue to do so uh, unless something changes. Just uh, going back to the technology side, um, while the se semiconductors had a good period, the, the one area which is uh, garnering a lot of attention now is the big tech side. And you've seen a lot of headlines talking about layoffs uh, from these big tech companies, Amazon, Alphabet, uh, Meta, the, you know, we're talking thousands of people. And we do hold a couple of the big tech names and it, it was actually a challenging quarter for them in terms of their market performance. Um, if we started with Apple, uh, it was a challenging quarter for them. And I think while China is reopening after sort of bringing back those lockdown restrictions, the, the production of the iPhone, I think has suffered a bit because those factories in China were just shut down so there could be some production issues that are going to come through in Apple's numbers going forward. But on the whole, I still think uh, Apple's still going to be able to provide a, a reasonable growth rate for the investors. Um, maybe not so much on the hardware side, but on the services side of the business. That's quite an interesting space uh, that it's moved into. Uh, the subscriptions that people have with Apple, um, you, you know, there's a, there's a, it's another area of growth for the company that's just going to help it to continue generating these really large uh, cash flows that we like in businesses. Uh, another company which had a difficult time, Amazon, uh, difficult quotes for Amazon. It faces a number of headwinds, be it higher inflation, higher fuel costs. The, they've got this overhang of uh, too many employees and too much warehouse space that they basically brought in during the pandemic to just cope with the serious increase in demand for e-commerce. But now that that's sort of pulled back a little bit, little bit they've kind of had to um, reduce that footprint 
be it employees or warehouse space, and they're still working through that. But I think the positive from that is the the profitability for the company, I think, is going to look a lot better going forward as they optimize their cost base. Um, another big part of Amazon's business is Amazon Web Services. Um, that's been a real growth engine for the company. And it is possible that we might see a slowdown in growth in that area as uh, technology spend the companies reduce that uh, slightly and that might have a bit of an impact on Amazon but I think we still expect uh, a decent growth rate from that part of the business yeah. the the one company which I think uh, a lot of us are maybe putting a question mark on or raising an eyebrow at is uh, Alphabet it's facing a number of headwinds um, probably the, the biggest headwind or the most talked about at the moment is ChatGPT and how that could impact the, the search model that Alphabet um, basically dominates. And are they going to lose market share there? Is it maybe all hype? I think there's a number of points that's probably just worth mentioning. One being that Alphabet will come out with their own uh, chat GPT version or some form of AI um, to compete with chat GPT. Um, another thing is that the search model that Alphabet uses, it's not quite the same as what chat GPT does. Um, and in terms of monetizing that, I think there's still a, you know, a bit of ground to cover before saying that the, 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 the end of days for Alphabet. The, another headwind that Alphabet's facing is, of course, TikTok. Uh, a lot more people, the eyeballs are being dis- uh, pulled away from the likes of YouTube and moving towards uh, TikTok, which uh, when it comes to advertisers, they're obviously going to put their spin where the eyeballs are. Yeah. So that's maybe a, another headwind that we've got to consider for Alphabet. So at this moment, we're keeping a very close watch on Alphabet. I think I'm just going to round off the technology point. I just wanted to come back to the semiconductors, um, two companies that we hold, ASML and NVIDIA. We've seen a lot of um, talk uh, come through in terms of the restriction of selling their products, be it the machines that make the semiconductors or the chips themselves being sold into China. The US is trying to restrict those sales. And that's something we're going to have to factor in when we look at the potential of these companies. But that aside, the I think sem- the semiconductor space from a secular standpoint just has uh, a tre- tremendous growth path ahead of us. And it's something that we believe is still going to remain strong and why we still continue to invest in those companies. I think now is maybe a good time to just uh, move on to how we see things going forward and our outlook. And maybe you can just, you spoke about what's happened in the markets. Maybe you can just speak about what you think is going to happen in the next quarter, the next year, and then maybe just go into a bit more of our longer term thinking. Yeah, sure. I think, you know, part of um, what we continue to do and what we're striving to do, and I think what we achieved quite nicely last year, was to continue to look for what we call quality companies. So there's a lot of metrics that that we go through to make sure that uh, you know, these companies are, are fit for purpose, be it management, um, environment, uh, and just how they operate and do business, um, and their particular sphere of influence in, in their space, um, and, and are going to be sustainable and be going to be around in 10, 20, 30 years' time. So there's that quality element of company that we're looking for. Um, and then it, it needs to have good earnings prospects and, and oft times established earnings prospects. You know, with some blue sky or, or upside, but uh, you know, we're not looking at startups or uh, you know, loss-making companies. These are quality and and growing earnings, growing dividends. A lot of the companies these days are, are into share buybacks to return, um, uh, you know, value to shareholders. So those are the kinds of things we're looking at. But we're looking at growing quality companies with the proviso that when we buy them, we buy them uh, at a fair price. Um, we don't want to overpay for companies that we that we put into the into the model. So it's all about finding, you know, and there's a lot of tick boxes there: quality, growing earnings, um, and uh, and and the price needs to needs to be right. So I think if if we continue to do, to do that, I think the model will continue to to prosper. Um, during the course of this last quarter, uh, we did make some adjustments to the portfolio. Um, with that lens on, having having a look at um, 
the portfolio that we hold and we, we rigorously look at, at, at all the stocks in the model. Uh, they have to pass muster all the time. It's not just you get in and, you, and you're in for life. Um, and a good example of that is Roche, which we sold out of um, in the fourth quarter. And, um, you know, you might ask Roche, it was, it was considered for a long time a core holding in the model. Um, it, it continues to grow. It's a steady eddy stalwart giving you that continuous growth in earnings. But there have been a few question marks around, you know, future growth. Um, and that aligned with the fact that uh, there's, there are other exciting, um, maybe more exciting prospects or more rewarding prospects out there that can potentially give us the same level of comfort uh, as a kind of dependable, steady eddy Roche, but with a bit more upside. Um, so... I think Roche also a little bit under fire with some of its product products, um, uh, biopharma products. You know, their their um, their exclusivity periods coming to an end. A lot of uh, competition for lot, biosimilars. A lot of competition, exactly. So I think we were looking for alternatives um, to that. We wanted to stay in the healthcare space, um, and uh, in that regard, we we came across a company called Ardex. Labs or Ardex Laboratories, which is a um, a pet care uh, company, so it fits. It's it's within that um, healthcare segment, giving us a little bit of diversity uh, and playing on on that theme of um, humanization of pets. People have just, uh, particularly during lockdown, uh, looked for more company and in, in pets. And Let's maybe d just because I think that's quite an important point: um, the humanization of pets. The, the idea behind it is that people are basically seeing their pet as a, a family member, so to speak. And with that comes the willingness to spend more on their pets, um, be it their food, their health care, uh, whatever the spend is. And I think if you couple that with the increase in the pet population during the pandemic, a lot of people were stuck at home and they basically got a, a new companion. And so if you combine the increased pet population with the, the increased willingness to spend on their pets, that creates a tremendous opportunity for companies in the space, uh, IDEX being one of those. M maybe you can also just go into a bit of, a, a bit of detail as to um, what attracted us to IDEX as the, the company itself in terms of its quality and its growth. You tick those, those two boxes very nicely, a high return on capital um, and the expectation that you know, earnings are going, going to continue to grow um, it is a company that has um, that kind of installs machines um, at uh, you know at veterinary practices, um, but those machines, be it X-ray machines or blood sampling machines or whatever they are, they they have consumables. You use a test tube or you use a an X-ray film or, or whatever it is, um, and uh, and that gives the the company a good bit of annuity income. So the more they can have that grow that installed base within the vets the more the annuity income can, can come through. So, yeah, as we said, good return on capital, good outlook um, on, uh, on the growth in their earnings and, uh, and ticking the, the quality box as well. We really did a thorough analysis of, of the company from that um, viewpoint um, and it came through very well. Uh, it, Idex wasn't the only company in that pet care space that we were looking at, but it certainly came out as one with the best, um, best opportunity. And if we compare that uh, against the Roche, the kind of stayed, maybe stagnant growth of Roche, um, it looks a lot more exciting and, and potentially more rewarding uh, for the model going forward. Uh, thanks, Craig. I think uh, we can leave it at there. Uh, it's been a good quarter. Let's see how the companies perform going forward. And we look forward to presenting you at the next quarter results. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, Craig.